<laughs> that sounds great. Um, ugh, one of those weeks. Um, well, firstly, I just wanted to say welcome to everyone who's um, here, everyone who will be here, everyone who's watching this later. I am so excited um, for this, which is the first in um, what will hopefully be a pretty significant series of uh, virtual readings, especially benefiting um, queer and disabled writers who have had um, books or financial opportunities or readings just fucked up by um, everything that's been going on with COVID-19. Uh, things are scary right now, uh, but you don't need me to tell you that, obviously. Um, I'm Zephyr Lasowski. I'm a poet. I'm an editor. Uh, I co-edit the journal um, Apogee Journal, and I um, am also uh, do a bunch of other things that I won't go into. But the main thing that I'm doing right now is I'm hosting this reading, which I'm excited about. We have um, four outstanding readers, uh, Kay Ulande Barrett, Saray Jarrell Johnson, Maura Jay, and Jesse Rice Evans. And I'll read all of their bios as we sort of progress through the reading. But I want to just encourage folks, um, as you're watching this, afterwards. Beforehand, you can't really do any more, but um, whatever way you want to, there's a Venmo link on the YouTube stream, on the website, um, and uh, on the Twitter links that have been circulating around all of this, uh, just to pay readers. Um, I am uh, really um, uh, excited about everyone again, and there's been an output of uh, interest and support already. So if you like what you're seeing, if you like what you're hearing, uh, by all, and you have some disposable income, which I know not everyone does right now, um, that's how people are uh, getting paid for this. So I would love to encourage you, uh, but not require you to consider um, suggested donation is $10. But um, again, everyone has financial constraints right now. Um, since we're uh, at about 10 minutes past, I'm going to start off by introducing uh, the first reader, who is Jesse Rice Evans, a white neuroqueer femme and Southern poet based in New York City, unceded Lenape territory, studying access pedagogy and digital culture. Her work's available in The Wanderer, Yes Poetry, and That Root among other places, and in her debut collection, The Uninhabitable, Uninhabitable, which came out last year from Sibling Rivalry Press. Um, it perhaps should have been nominated for a Lammy, but there are a lot of books that should have. Um, so I'm not going to get too petty right now, but um, please uh, welcome Jesse. Oh, and before that, I'd just like to say as well that uh, there's an access copy at the bottom of the tiny URL um, if you want to follow along to Jesse's reading. So um, please, uh, please welcome Jesse. Hi, thank you, Zephyr, for that introduction. Um, you're neither the first nor the last person who will stumble over the name of my book. Um, and that's totally okay. Thank you for doing your best. I appreciate it. Um, so I have a few kind of weird poems. Um, if you're going to follow along in the access copy, I'm not married to the order that everything is currently in, so I might mix that up a little bit. Um, but if you want to follow along, please feel free to do that. Um, I'll try to tell you at least what page I'm reading off of in the, in the access copy, um, if that would be helpful for folks. Um, I'm stressed out being at home um, with my partner and um, I'm still able to work my job, which is pretty amazing. Um, but I'm not like a, don't have the emotional capacity to, to do my job really. Um, so some of these poems are about some of that. They're all not written recently because I don't have the capacity to do any writing either. <laughs> I know I'm not alone there. Symptoms. One, nausea. Two, 
muscle cramps. Three, fatigue. Four, dry eyes. Five, loss of libido. You have done bad, but others have done worse. So a couple of these are from um, a manuscript project that um, is done is like submitted to like the two presses that I have any interest in working with. <laughs> um, so fingers crossed that folks want to publish um, my next book. It's gonna it's called Acne, and a couple of the pieces I'm reading tonight are from that, and a couple other of the pieces I'm reading are from I don't know which book I'm working on anymore. This next poem is about not knowing which book I'm working on. Let us now praise famous men. This is after Natalie Eilbert. It's a good place to start the edge with puzzles, coloring, giving your all, giving, giving. I give as if it is what I was put on this earth to do. I am okay with it. I wear a scarf with Pokemon all over it and no one notices. It's a floral, not a token of my deep-seated need to connect with the non-human, the animal, the non-human animal. For a while, I consider how to integrate each of these as icons, my need for evolution, demonstrative of my crave for change, constant change, the only thing unchangeable has to be the thing itself. I ask myself if I am writing my fourth book, and in truth, I don't know. That is okay. My self-worth is not enmeshed with my ability to be popular. I learned early that this is extricable and this is fine that I do not want anything resembling this, that I'm just fine as the independent entity I have always been. Do not call for my attention. The sure way to not get what you want, to demonstrate thirst for it over and over. I don't respond to desperation. There's an alchemy to surviving the public, chilled tequila, headphones, CBD, confidence to the point of arrogance. It follows me, but it also is me. Over time, I have continued to be good. I have continued to trust despite it all. You are welcome. I have brought it in as if from a storm, a dew trembles along its skin. It's deeply solid and core of knowing it and doing it anyway. The thing that grants me power, my whiteness, is also the thing I betray, willfully. Your art does not interest me unless it intends to shred itself into a flay and abject and abundance of pain that revels in itself, its ability to be fully what it is. I want to feel it. I want to feel, make me feel it, make me, make me feel it all. I want the lurch, the yank, the sharp, the throb, the end, the end, the end, the yes. It is okay to hide from it at first, the it unraveled, the it on apology, the it no, it hinged, it younger, it spooned, it cast, it, 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 yester glow, the after that becomes the it, the premonition of it, the thing you fear, the it, the proof everyone needed, the it, the grim, the receipt, the door left guarded, the promise of freedom at the end of the dungeon, the dungeon, the assassination, the alimony, the pathology, it. It, it, it bangs on the bar two feet down. It feels heard only when it shouts. It is threatened and it does what it can to disguise it, the weakness, the weakness, the weakness that grows and grows. It, 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 yes, it. Um, cool. That poem's about being angry all the time. <laughs> and I think this next poem, which I've never, um, 
no one's ever even seen before, I don't think. But I was reading it earlier and I was like, this poem's also about being mad all the time. So it kind of, um, I'm not good at being like sad or grieving. And so this time has been really complicated and hard for me. So I want to just be angry. And um, I'm good at being angry. I think this poem is also about being really angry. And I, this title is a working title, but it's called The Class War Comes Home. <laughs> Um, it's after Danielle Confondo. A singer, I'm sorry, I'm really, I'm nervous to read this out loud. I've never done it except to myself earlier today. And I, there's still like typos in the access copy. <laughs> sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Pretend that didn't happen. The class work comes home. A single silver braid encases cord to which you drip from, still gooed still infant. Mother says winch and your furtive cry for dollops grim mediocre grim and extent. Before beginning it knows the rush tangle rush spill her emptying her mouth of money coins brushing out and filling each elbow each dimpled plane. A tether she craves it thirstily want infant and wordless in her simple theme simple look Look, I promise as long as I live, this will be the last of me. Her need to churn against void makes sense when you think about it. Little girl, loathing girl, acquiescent girl, good girl. She is a good girl and I am a bad girl. Claiming a fringe as my own and keeping by it, scraping myself a nest and not leaving. Not so much a good girl in that instinctual dismissal of the cheat. Not so much cheap, more withholding, more abysmal. Warrior, oh, bony warrior. Keep shut the tap of coins. That stream cacophonous from your face hole. Fucking deck for fucking marble. Fucking expensive appliances. Fucking wealth like a skin of Skeeters. Oh, if you're a Yankee, Skeeters are mosquitoes. That's the end of the poem. <laughs> um, I was thinking of adding that note to the end um, about the skeeter, because it I feel like it might be confusing, but I guess this is my first time reading it. So y'all will have to tell me what you think. I'm gonna read one more poem. I always include way more than I um, actually have time to read. Okay, I'll read this one. In, uh, in Acne, which will be my second book, again, Fowler, be trying to publish Acne by Jesse Van um, for 2021 or 2022, we can talk. But it has a series of poems that are like titled Specimen, colon, and then something. And there ended up being a few called Specimen, colon, men, which like synthetic them, it's not really complicated. Um, but, but they're all taken from like memories and like the, the like sensory aspect of memory um, as like a thing to examine and pull out and make a prominent point, part of the whole collection. Best of men. Daughter drenched, daughter coughed, daughtered. I'm triggered by white men, how they are coded but still hunt. Wolves loosed from the edges, I neglect to trim how I magma over the couch, around the corners like dark under, but also through. Knowing and mooding, frivolous, allowing a jealousy to snake through the hunk of scar tissue clumped together at. Feed me something false. I don't care about favors or what I owe you. Your disgrace, your cruelty, your light box, easy qualities to mock or miss. Get closer, come closer, handle me like a trinket, waiting beyond the shelf or tucked away somewhere. Wound me, cut scrum back like a shrub, crack me caustic and ghastly, the things I boil inside an echo, spinal fluid, a wet apology. Insufferable vain woman after woman, carving their names into the mirror, the shock of recognizing a voice and running, I remember the voices I've heard just since for sound I am unraveling 
I could never be scrubbed clean of my past, my sympathies. After a Percocet, I am looser, abundant, and generous. Shedding desperation to feel useful to become more than a gracious host of spiny intellect. Still, I mourn the apologia of my condition, unable to stand in the ways I used to stand. You know, on my legs, brutal anger. You, after a bottle of Pinot Grigio and excess, call me specimen, call me home, call me backpack full of pain pills, heating patches, wax earplugs, him unburdened. Everything is a restriction, so I unbutton my jeans, peel them like a skin, and recline the side window upon heating pads with LaCroix, with tequila, with an idleness I find frightful. Thank y'all. Thank you so much, Jesse Rice Evans. Uh, the Uninhabitable, available through Sibling Rivalry Press. Um, if y'all are just uh, joining in right now, uh, I'm so excited to have you. We have three readers left. Again, if you have any um, spare money to just tip readers, there's a Venmo link around. This is just a reminder for those of you who are tuning in now. I'm not trying to pressure you into giving money if you don't want to. But um, that was incredible, Jesse. I'm really excited next to um, introduce our following reader, Maura J, who is an agender writer of White Mountain Apache descent. They were the winner of the 2018 Pacific Spirit Poetry Prize and were Frontier Poetry's 2019 Frontier New Voices Fellow. Their work is published or is forthcoming in The Shallow Ends, Wildness and Black Warrior Review. I just read the Black Warrior poems actually, they're really good. Um, and they currently live in Massachusetts it, with their partner in the occupied Massachusetts homelands of greater Boston. Their debut poetry collection, Bury Me in Thunder, is out now uh, with Sundress Publications. And you can find more of their work at morajay.com or on Twitter at MixMoraJ. Um, and again, if you're trying to follow along, there are links to the access copy on the website. Thank you, Maura. Honda, dagate. Welcome, hello. I'm going to be reading from my debut book, Bury Me in Thunder, which I've placed behind me so perfectly. So if you have the ability to check it out, I encourage you to do so. I also have some contributor copies if you would like to buy some from me directly or you know, hit up that Venmo. So I'm just going to be reading some of my favorite poems from the book. This first one is called My Brother Does Not Know He Is Fragile. He is playing on your knees like the sweet boy he is. Call his hands gentle instead of bone breakers. Know he is a vessel of force, an angered sunrise pulsing orange against unsettling gray. He could hold a twister inside of him and never speak of it. He is a compromise of a wounded mother, a rotting father, born into the sights of a hawk, waiting to be fed the injured and weak. See how he holds the small chain in his grip. What strength, what violence that lies untapped. Call it gunfire and pleading for the fist to stop. Call him recovery from when he runs back in from the rain outside, shoes wet, face red and heaving. He knows how glee opens his lungs when he watches a bird hit the window at breakfast. Call him a doting audience to the end. He says he only knows dreams as a knife, as rabid teething. Remember how he once killed the blue nights in October, turned on all the lights in his room, declared the sun an everlasting scar in his palace. Call it blood letting his fear turning it on its side and using the scalpel to pull its weeping parts. Say he only knows about the resurrections, but not the dead. As the first boy to know war, he says he is a hungry bullet, but he only knows the first part to the Icarus myth. He never let you tell him the end. So that's just one that I really like. The next one that I'm gonna be reading is on page 49 of the book. It's called Bitter Bones. Bundle your shirts in deerskin. 
take them to the edge of the ocean, throw them in the water for your selfishness and grievances with death, reject who deny your existence. They find you less threatening, born to be the mirror of your neglectful father. They do not know how you carried matches in your shoes, ready to strike up everyone. There are women who held guns against Indian heads just as much as any white man. They just know how to look good while crying, so no one ever bothered them. Remember to bury your magic under tree roots. Do not dig them up for seven generations. Let them ferment with untouched hands. Your grandfather would have warned you about this world if he had not died long before you were born. Trust in him. Death has made powerful ghosts for you to talk to. Awesome. Okay, so this next one that I'm going to read is called Canonizing Threatened Tongues. It is on page 62 of the book. Canonizing Threatened Tongues. And now there are women without language. My mother unable to articulate nasal tones and I speak unraveling and stumbling to know the fullness of Chigashe. When she was a child, her adoptive white mother threatened that if she was bad, she would be sent back to the res. And my mother didn't know what that meant, but homeland became a threat or government allotted territory did. It was all kind of fitting in that way. She would teach me lessons in her great grandmother's rocking chair and we fell in love the corresponding ways a wound can hold meaning, can hold tenderness, that pain is not monogamous and holds many lovers. And when I was a child, I held my usual sets of guilt that my mother did not really have a mother or father but I could not hold it long as sage smoke embedded itself into my hair, twined in the sunlight and drumming on deer hides from when she had enough gas money to take us to the nearest powwow. And how we danced on the outskirts, almost in the trees, just us flattening the earth with joyous feet and made language to store the ache of our own stories. So really what this book is about is being able to kind of look at how various kinds of intergenerational trauma kind of live through the body and through memory. In my own experiences, you know, being a transgender um, indigenous person, being able to look at chronic health. So all of these kind of look through these kind of stages of grief, which I feel like we're all kind of experiencing right now in a way with these kind of losses we're having. So this next poem that I'm gonna read is called Peach Slices on Bread, which is on page 77 of the book. The food we split between ourselves mimics cellular mitosis, the womb of it blooming until at last the insides are scrambled. I don't remember our fingers knowing such want, but then again, I often forget our fixed nature. They say it is primal, but we have given another name for it, optimism, the leaching pipe dream that clings to skin, air sticky in the sweet stench of rotting fruit and anxious moving hands. I won't tell you that this place we made is safe, violence hangs just a peach slice away, the knife edging closer to our fingers. I know we want to start over, to make these parts of ourselves disappear. I won't tell you about the grain shortages, the water being poisoned and drained, our paradise is full of mold. Why do I have to tell you anything? Your ears are too hungry to listen, even if it is necessary for you to know about the nagging famine at our door. All right, and then this next one that I'm going to read is actually one of my personal favorites of the book, um, kind of exploring names and how names are given in my community 
and the kinds of names that are given or not given and how that relates to my own experiences, again, in being a gender and being able to find kind of strength in a name. So this poem is called Time in Names and Found Things. We don't name our girls things that can die. Flowers are too oft subjugated to murder, decay. But what happens when I am not girl and not boy? Do I inhabit the name of ghosted things, undead things? Even seeds stomped into the ground are capable of returning. Part chimera of magic and honey, body painted in holy white and lightning. Come autumn, there will be another birthday for the not girl and not boy with name that of a crow's rib cage. My lover and I talk about building a house, knowing we have translated ceremonies into unfamiliar skeletons before. I am still waiting for the resurrection of my body, planted in new ground and tissue, howling like an animal who has ripped their leg from a bear's mouth and sang with joy. I pray to the great creature who lingers at the edge of the river, unbleached from the words of white men. Yes, here the beast is found purposeful and good. It does not matter if it is the not boy and not girl. You do not look past the jaw of the thing that will swallow you whole. And yes, here is a place that exists only with song and tradition to take in loving things, even if the name of it holds death. So I actually have a little bit more time. So I'm going to read one or two more poems depending on where I land for myself. So this next one um, is called Some Kind of Future. Witness my ancestors born from a mountainous womb, spilling into the desert with dried mouths and heads meant for a crown. I have watched my mother furiously needle thread into stories, aching to unbury her family, now lost into the rivers, now lost into the weight of exploitation. Here, see, her sow the auntie's new tongues, able to sing joyously while fingers dance reeds of, into basketry, birthing symmetry like lightning across Tilwozu during monsoonal rains. My mother can't teach me our words, her father stripped of voice and face, leaving her alive but evaporated. I whisper to her, gift her syllabic memory, showing her how ceremony originates in the heart and lungs. I call to her, Shima, my mother, and I can see her eyes flicker inwards toward shimmering sunlight and her father standing beyond Dizalagai. She dreams of leaping across canyons into the bosom of warmed bodies. I can see it. I can see her eyelids twitch and my bones thrum with longing. I know we can't undie, can't be unkidnapped, can't be unviolenced, but I can hold my mother, her left side weaker after the stroke. And she looks to me, her eyes pale as water. And I swear I hear her whisper, Goa, home. So thank you so much for letting me be able to read some of these poems for you. Um, like I said, I have some copies if you want to be able to buy them directly from me. Otherwise, be able to enjoy the rest of these readings and I hope you had a nice time. Thank you so much again to Zephyr for the lovely introduction and I'm excited to hear everyone read their pieces too. Hey, thank you so much for it. Um... That was great. Uh, so um, I also just want to like acknowledge um, just like seeing, like thank you to everyone who's 
Uh, oh my God, we just got more donations. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, uh, again, if you're just tuning in now, uh, this is all uh, viewer supported, as they used to say with, um, I don't know, when there is still like a semblance of uh, like state funded TV that wasn't transparently awful. Um, this is all like viewer supported. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's been donating. If you don't have the money, that's totally fine. I understand it. There are so many other things that, you know, are wanting right now, but there is a Venmo link if you're able to pay anything, that'd be great. Um, and thank you so much to um, all of our readers. I realized, um, <laughs> Uh, showing showing your bedroom and your living space is a vulnerable act, and like reading poetry is also a vulnerable act. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge both of those things. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, coming up next is Saray Jarrell Johnson, who I'm so excited to hear read. They're a librarian and writer from Piscataway, New Jersey, and hold a master's in library and information science from Drexel, and an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University. Saray is the author of two books, Slingshot, which came out in 2019, and is a 2020 uh, Lambda Literary Award finalist for gay poetry, um, and also How Greek Immigrants Made America Home, which came out in 2018. Saray's work has appeared in the New York Times, Boston Review, Rewire News, The Root, and Motherboard slash Vice, they have given speeches and lectures at the White House, TEDx Columbia University, Brown University, the University of Pennsylvania, community organizations, churches, festivals, and conferences throughout the United States. And his work has been supported by Davis Potter Scholarship Fund, the Australia Foundation, Leeway Foundation, Disabled Writers, Culture Strike, and the dozens of countless community members who believe in what he does. Um, please welcome. Saray. And again, uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, there's an access um, copy on the website if you want to follow along. Um, there's also links to buy books there as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zephyr. And also, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Maura. And a preemptive thank you to Kay. Um, this week has been just, whew, was it even there? Who could ever know? Um, yeah, like some serious lupus stuff has been going down, but um, specifically a shortage of my primary medication, hydroxychloroquine, and that has been horrifying. Um, so it's been a big scramble. And um, also I've been in quarantine, like many of you watching probably are for about, for 16 days, it's 16 days today. Um, and so needless to say, I'm very horny and this set will be very horny as well. So, you know, just prepare yourself for that. Um, my sets are always pretty horny, but like super horny now. So it's just a, a warning, um, uh, a note, but I'm going to start angry because, um, I watch a lot of the news, um, because it makes me feel fake powerful. And um, it's given me every reason to read this poem, which is called A Review of Hamilton in American Musical. <clears throat> if I could go back in time, which is a game I am sometimes forced to play, I would lynch George Washington standing there in step with slaves whose teeth he yanked out and wore for oil paintings and public appearances, also auctions, to be sure, my boyfriend and I won the Hamilton lottery last week. $10, of course. Every beige actor singing on a wheel, oh, New York, oh, New York, greatest city over a field of black bones scraped clean. The subway is also a boneyard. The papers won't tell me where, so I say everywhere, except nobody but nobody's cares what I think I joined the organization because I wanted to practice holding America hostage, Huckleberry Finn, stage coach robbers 219 times the nigger. That's the hardest part of the whole thing. Nobody cares what I think unless I frighten them. Nothing ever resolves itself in America. No incentive, you see, all fireworks are just replicas of some foreign bomb. They drop bombs and bronze sculptures for every genocide anyway. Somebody says we've got to bomb North Korea. 
Nobody cares what I think. America is an experiment lit up by sparking wires. Oh, please. Oh, please. Let it burn down this time. Okay. Let's just jump right into the horny poems then. So this is my one of my favorite horny poems that I've written because it's horny for a lot of different men. So like you, I really get like a full spectrum. Um, and it is a crown of sonnets. It's a broken crown of sonnets. I like to think of it as a modern crown of sonnets. Um, and it's named after Satan's boyfriends. Um, and well, some of Satan's boyfriends, he actually had way more than this, but um, these were his favorite boyfriends because they became like the princes of hell. Um, anyways, um, their names were Belial and Morningstar and Andromalius and Barakajal and Penemuel and Ronob and Zegon. Everybody knows I know a secret. I've stared at windows until hands poke through and I've nursed men left on my doorstep with stern, unshorn nipples like fraying tissue. We learned we could never go home, at least not without making pistols of ourselves. I was made to jaw on your fennel stalk. We were made and raised to raise the fallen and lift them high by their turgid tap roots. Everyone's heard I saw two king snakes fuck. Everybody knows I know who gets more pleasure. The pleasure arrives for the taker who takes cacophonously, superfluously. The yes, please fuck. The no, go home, finish. The yes, please fuck, finish. So run home on the white bus clouded by need. Your mama wonders who's been over. Since it was a black, she can smell it. Must have been that blue magic smeared over your pillowcase, my head shape dented and scented and haunting your fingertips. Anyone but a black, she thinks. Someone pretty and black, my mother hopes. In this scene, no one gets what they have wanted. In this scene, you ask Jeeves penis envy. In this scene, you fly me to Arizona, four stained fingers, twist, twist inside, push, push. In every mirror, you find a demon, four stained fingers, twist, Twist inside, push, push. In this house, there is no God but Dowling. In this apartment, we take rent in rimming. In this hovel, you flash your dick on path trains. In this shack, I suck you deep on the pier. In this delusion, you kiss me in public. In this delusion, I meet your parents. In this delusion, we have soft babies. In this delusion, you keep a steady job. You are hard work. You are brute labor. The original sin in house paint and the tripod upon which the Pythia sat and words repel you and my tongue does not. And we become sentient and escape and string back into the Gordian knot. You ox cart king. You spike silver cellar turned gold stroker in the fire and tar woods behind my house, framed in white flames. Antlers draped in tiny lights we learned were beetles. You did it. I let you and you did it. Blood magic in Hennessy, I'm sorry. I promise you I paid and paid and paid with eight years of no good dick, with violence. Blood magic and Hennessy, I'm sorry. If you must know, I loved you in loops. First, I'd puke on you, then watch you fold drawers, little squares of black in Red Hook houses. Daddy, I look for you in other faces, changed by years of no good dick and violence. In this scene, I Google penis envy, my stern, unsure nipples like fraying tissue. Daddy, I look for you in other faces, four stained fingers, twist, twist inside, push, push. You must know that I loved you in loops, blood magic and Hennessy. I'm sorry. In this hovel, you flash your dick on path trains changed by years of no goodness and violence. In this delusion, I meet your parents, have soft babies, you keep a steady job behind our house, framed in white flame, antlers draped in tiny lights we learned were beetles. Everyone's heard I saw two king snakes fuck. Everybody knows I know a secret. Okay. This one I always have to give with a disclaimer because I, especially in this time, would never, ever, ever even consider dating a cop. I don't know why that got into my poem. I do apologize. Um, I'm, I am a survivor of police violence myself. So, you know, I take not dating cops very seriously. Um, but the speaker is not me. It's not me. So, um, but it is um, 
about a uh, mentor of mine. Um, and the poem is called Magenta. And it has a running title, so I'll have to say that twice. Magenta, the kind my homie Leah calls screaming vulva, a sparkler through gray hair with glint of mercury. Quickly become elders in the city, smears our fingers like new murder. There my mentor was Sinti Roma's bleeding tarot. When I was a kid, they wrote Femme Shark Manifesto. I lived a life with pink books and gem mischief. That zine was the zine that I mean when I mean the zine. It was a roll call for femme styles, pumped a saline shot of sadness, but at least there was fucking to look forward to. I wanted to grow up, then be them, then be their friend forever. Wash all their dishes, eat drying pizza out the box so I filled three bags and moved to Oakland. It was blank verse for 10 months and fucking. I slept on Anna's couch as ever and wrote for weed magazines. Hot-handed roof gardens blush pink as lips. The other ocean coughed out boys with lips and lisps. Prince punctuated all my trysts. I dated a cop for about six months, a future flush with killer's gear. He won't tell you about the rapes, but he paints and sculpts in his face where eyebrows once were. And should have been. Alas, this poem can't reinstall the skin nor grow his eyebrows back again. His fetid hide has ceased to be for all of our eternities. And for this, only impotence. A poem mauve with fizzy goiter, flaccid as specific six phrase few. A poem to coil you in fistula of yarn and stars. Okay, I'm gonna read a quick, really horny one. It's probably the horniest poem I've ever written. Uh, before I do that, I just wanna say that this is like the disability reading of my dreams. So thank you so much again, Zephyr, for letting me be a part of it. Um, yeah, all the writers here are writers that I either like read constantly and refer people to constantly um, or really look forward to becoming more familiar with their work. Um, and it just feels like such a great opportunity for us to virtually be together and also to lift up the folks who know uh, and have been doing the work of like lifting up sick voices um, and disabled voices since before uh, awful panic um, and a disabling disease hit, you know, the world. Um, so it really is the right people in the room. Not that there aren't other people who are here, but um, this is also a great collection of folks. So anyways, um, this poem is called Doppelganger. Queer utopians think human beings are perfectible, but we're not, we're just correctable. In an hourly motel, I recall that Kim Adonisio poem about tattoos and ask you how many you have. Although I count 14 every time you doze and add your spit to the mysterious stains on the pillows, but the ink proliferates in twilight sticky gold. Is a cover up one or two or three tattoos? And how many about your forced disappearances? And how many about the appearance of manhood? And how many about being a man with his face buried in pillows, a short black man hydroplaning down our impossible? I hate how much I love when you suck my toes and I despise you for making me beg. That's why I can't know you. That's why I stay perpetually ahead of your judgment. You look just like me when I'm fucking you from behind. I'll suck that shrimp cock till the glove pops plus one extra watt before I figure it out. I don't know God anymore, but let's stay here on our knees and wait for him to come. I feel like that's one of the more controversial poems I've ever written for someone too, because like he likes the poem, but he feels like he does not judge me. So then he's like, well, I feel like that was me. But either way, you know, it's a horny poem that I wrote. I don't actually think I have time for another one. So I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap it on up. Um, thank you everyone for being here and have a really great night. Hopefully we'll all be able to be in both digital and physical blended space soon. Yes, thank you so much for that, Saray. Um, my microphone was on mute, but I was going, woo! Like, and I was like fanning myself after like half of half of those poems and in the middle of them and throughout all of them. Uh, yeah, physical and digital hybrid spaces. That's the goal, right? That's the goal of the future. Um, but also digital spaces too, you know, they're important. Um, 
finally, we have one reader left. Um, thank you so much to everyone again. Um, for Again, thank you to everyone who's donated, everyone who's been generous with your time. Um, when I like first like tweeted out who's interested in this sort of reading series, like I was blown away by the amount of like support that people expressed on Twitter and elsewhere on the internet as well. Um, so again, I'm like really grateful for everyone who made this happen, which includes a significant portion of the audience as well. Um, and of course the readers. Uh, finally, finally, um, and if anyone else is just tuning in now, again, Venmo handle in the uh, bio, no pressure to donate if you don't have any money. But if you do, you know, maybe consider spreading it around a little bit. Um, finally, uh, our last reader for the night is Kay Ulande Barrett, um, who just had a book come out and who I'm so excited to hear it read. Uh, Kay Barrett, AKA Brown Round Boy, is a poet, performer, and cultural strategist. Kay has featured at the Lincoln Center, the UN, Symphony Space, Princeton University, Tucson Poetry Festival, New York Poetry Festival, the Dodge Poetry Foundation, the Hemispheric Atmosphere, the Hemispheric Institute, and Brooklyn Museum. They are a two times Pushcart Prize nominee, Best of the Net, Split This Rock 2019 nominee, and 2019 Queerdos Literary Honoree by them, who also just featured this um, outstanding interview and conversation with Kay around their upcoming book or their book that just came out. Kay's been offered fellowships and residencies from Lambda Literary Review, Bona slash Voices, Monson Arts, VCCA, and Macondo, as well as guest faculty for the Poetry Foundation. Their contributions are found in Academy of American Poets, The New York Times, Asian American Literary Review, PBS NewsHour, Friction, The Huffington Post, Bitch Magazine, and more. Their first book, when the Chant Comes was published by Topside Press in 2016. More Than Organs, published by Sibling Rivalry Press, is their second collection. Currently, Kay lives outside the New York City area with his jolly dog, who presumably won't be a part of this reading, but who can say? Please <laughs> welcome Kay. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Zephyr. Thank you so much, Maura, Jesse, and Saray for marvelous readings. And um, yeah, so COVID pandemic life. Accessibility existed before this. So I just want to say that, like before this, this crisis. And I just want to, again, I think as Saray has mentioned, but just name also too how sick and disabled, queer, trans people, spoony people have been doing this. Black indigenous POC folks have been creating gorgeous spaces that withstand, you know, cis man-made time. So I'm just grateful for you all. And thank you everybody for doing poetry on a Friday. I'm gonna read a new poem. It is hopefully gonna be in my third book. Who knows when that'll be, but all it's about one of my favorite foods that I used to hate. It's about an artichoke. And I used to hate them. I used to think they were so gross and like, ugh, they look like little bugs. And then I tried one and it was like, Pfft. so this is for my mom and my aunt Edna's favorite food, the artichoke. Lessons you offer, how one can be prickly tender, how to work, how to scrape, how to green and green, yet on the inside, how to purple, how to majestic. Someone thought to open up the sharp thing, rename it meal, flesh center barricaded by miscellaneous nut lives. Whole life likely a dare, I too know, to breathe shield, what it is to be jagged, to be your own bouquet, confused for ornament. Wrap limbs into knotted lonely, disown coniferous, maybe to be steamed, to unhinge joints, to want to be believed, to be beloved, to be known for your buttery, to be raked of it. Even though mind cluster, yes, to live honestly and be considered a thistle. Beget a body noble, something more than circumstance, than exterior, fed up with being, Mistaken for a weed, ache to splay like firework, seen as 
extra, seen as too much work. Blithely considered at Brooklyn dinner parties to be an acquired taste. And, oh, that's too fancy. Or, how do you even eat that? What do you do with that? Shimmer silk from censor, want nothing more than to be pride. For someone to just dig in, to be brave or, or curious, to quest and use all hands to spread limbs, not mind the bold foliage. Thin blade skin draws blood when held too tightly. Wish for someone just to say, this looks impossible, but what if? What if this could be my most favorite thing? Bet somewhere inside there's blossom. Thank you. Uh, I'm just, I feel like all my things I'm, I'm not good at writing poetry right now, y'all. Like I've just been using spoons to like safety plan and make sure my people are safe, make sure I'm safe. So uh, it's so interesting to read poems and yet feel disconnected from writing them. Um, this next poem, which is also about food, it's kind of my favorite thing is food, is called How to Make Salabat. And it's in my latest book, More Than Organs. And it's a cutie, I like it. It's a recipe poem. How to Make Salabat. Hoy, listen, this is how to cut ginger. It's a root, she said, from Chicago basement on first snow of the year, it's the 90s. Snow is a big deal. Tear salt missing ocean salt, she cleared her throat. Based on where we're from, nothing can prepare us for frozen. Fast forward. College front asks, hey, how do you make that tea again? Yeah, the, the one you used to drink when it started to snow. I want to say, my ma is dead. She made this every time it began to snow. I buried both my parents by age 25. Have you called your mother? Have you checked to see if there's a tumor slowly living under her skin? What I recall most was the crying, which is a lot like any drink really, uh, a pouring, which reminds me of something a friend once mentioned. If you only write about crying and death, nobody will buy your books. What I really do is listen to the same voicemail um, over and over where my mother's throat is miles away, mouth full of liquid, steeped tea bags for lungs, just waiting, just waiting for the right time to let go. What I actually want to say all the time is, is that grief, grief is the full-time job. What I say to my friend only mentions directions, which leads one to think about when my mother finally went back. A visit, she coined it. Vacation, which is code word for for good. Uh, two weeks later, she says in calling card staccato, I'm in bad shape, Anuk. Which is, um, which is migrant code for death. Words have multiple meanings. My mama taught me that. In essence, she was my first poetry instructor. This is how a mother tongue is whittled dull. Abandoned building, once home. When my mother dies, I couldn't say that for years, you know? Like, I couldn't say, she's dead. How in three languages, I don't have words for absence. A mouth becomes thud. English becomes harder to swallow. Did you know that on the worst days, I forget what her favorite song was? But the tiny eruption of her cough repeats in the loop all the time now. Thank you. Um, going in that vibe of sick people, because those are my people, I wrote a poem 
and that's what I do. And I think um, I'm trying to elaborate on what it means to be sick and loved. Because sometimes I know what that means and sometimes I don't know what that means at all. Uh, and so this poem is called Sick for Sick. And it's not about like fucking or romantic love or it could be, it's mainly just about kindred. Like to me what sick kindred is. Sick for sick. Her body patched, swollen skin, hair flex, gone rogue, mismatched knees, ache knits, quilts throughout. Curvature, a soft thing. She said, if we hum close, close enough that our chests touch, um, shared breath comes from belly up. That, that is not platonic. Now, Breathe same air, nostril kinetic by way of brow cleft pirouette of migraine, syllables swirl temples, strain is something to lull here, together. When nerves are ablaze, I'm told to be blanket. Lay my torso on hers, abdomen to abdomen, core to core. Is this what a field does to a hill? Spill it with poppies? I wait on her skill, how she will sigh. The human body is a heating pad, limbs bonfire, flip sheets, you can't reverse sick. Today, we don't want to. Chest pulse, softest lake. Come spring, we never do this again. There's only the memory of it. How her lungs cathedral, how I prayed there on the ledge, of inhale, sacred cough hymn, spasm luminescence. Syllables stretched, muscled sacrament more than splay us, petals in overlap, us, an ampersand on fire. Thank you. So this is my last poem. Uh, you know, I like to keep it light. It's a grief poem. But oh yeah, I again want to thank Zephyr for Zephyr's curation. I want to thank Moira, Jesse, and Saray for sharing this space in the world and online and in Zoom. And I want to thank you all for being present here and chilling on your Fridays with poetry. Uh, this poem is for those who are forlorn. That's like all my friends. Okay. While looking at photo albums, Christmas Eve, 2016. Before everyone died in my family, first definition I learned was my mother's maiden name, Ulanda, which literally means of the rain. And biology books remind us the pouring has a pattern, has purpose. Namesake means release. And for my mother meant flee, meant leave. Know exactly what parts of you slip away, drain sediment of a body is how a single mama feels. On the graveyard shift, only God is awake is where my family banked itself. A life rooted in rosaries like nuns in barricades scream, people power one out of five are forced. Leave to a new country. The women in my family home, in my heart, like checkpoints, which is what they know, which is, you know, like a halt, not to be confused for stop, which is what happened to my mama's breath when she went home for the last time. I didn't get to hold her hand as she died. I said I tried. It just translates to I couldn't make it. In time, I tell myself. Ocean salt and tear salt are one in the same. I press my eyes shut. Cup, ghost, howl. Cheeks split with wood warm, which is to say, make yourself a harbor. <sighs> anyway, once I saw this pamphlet that said, what to do when your parent is dead. And I couldn't finish reading, mm, but I doubt that it'll inform the audience what will happen which is to say, you will pour your face and hands 
and smother your mother's scream on everything you touch. Turn eyelids into oars. Go, paddle to find her. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely night. Oh my God. Um, thank you so much for that. Okay. Um, I think that draws this reading to a close. Um, I just would like to thank all of the readers again. Um, Y'all were brilliant. This has been sustaining uh, for me um, in ways that I wasn't even expecting. Um, and thank you to the audience as well. Um, for those of you who, yeah, thanks. Um, a fully captioned version of this should be uploaded within um, probably within four hours, um, but let's say definitely by tomorrow, if not before then, I don't wanna commit myself to more work um, than I can <laughs> physically do. Um, thank you again for everyone. This has been incredible. Um, I'm so deeply grateful and appreciative of you all. Thank you, Zephyr. Everybody give Zephyr a big applause and care and kindness. Yay. Thank you, Zephyr. Thank, Thank you, you Zephyr. Yeah. Thank you for being marvelous. <laughs> yeah, all of y'all as well. Um, all right, I think this is it. I'm going to end this live stream then. <laughs> Bye. Bye, y'all. Take care.